Good morning. Good morning. I view Virginia and Maryland, this whole mid-Atlantic region, as my home. I'm really a Yankee. I'm from upstate New York. I, I did, thanks for the great introduction, but I came to uh, the NSA almost 20, 24 years ago, and I never, never really left the region. Uh, when you leave this area, you might hear about NSA versus CIA or Maryland, Virginia, or Republican, Democrat, but when you get out to the West Coast, when you go to Tel Aviv, when you go to Europe, they kind of look at this whole area as the leader in, in cyber innovation. And, uh, the, and really the future. There's so many interesting companies uh, up and down this, this region. I'm just really had uh, an honor to be come down and be part of this. Um, today I'm going to talk about a couple different things. Uh, we're going to talk about the cybersecurity market. Now, my guess here is everybody here is an auditor, a pen tester, an incident responder person, right? Even people who haven't had their coffee yet are going, going like this. And even though I've been on the vendor side for about 20 years, I'm coming out to basically try to inspire you so that when you have that moment of success, which is really a moment of failure, right? You discover the intrusion, you do the pen test, you, you, you get the customer or the client to fail the audit or whatnot. What are you gonna tell them? There's so many different things going on in the world right now, moving to the cloud, there's more and more threat, there's more and more ways to audit. I'm gonna kind of walk you through what's been going on the last 20 years or so, so you can kind of get a leg up on what's going on for the next 20 years. And then I'm also really interested in people who wanna start companies. So I'm gonna tell you how to pitch ideas. Now if you're on the buying side and you really, really like a vendor and you want to bring them into your organization, you're going to have to pitch this to your organization. So these rules apply. So hopefully I can inspire some folks to go out and, and start companies and whatnot. And the last thing we're going to talk about is the future. And I used to be somebody who was like, I really don't want to be one of those talking heads on TV and predict next year's you know, predictions and whatnot. But I'm going to give you kind of a 10 year look down the road from based on what I've been seeing in the government, the startup companies I'm working with and what I saw at, at, at Tenable Network Security. All right, so the cyber market, right? If you want to drop some really interesting knowledge, you know, if you're at a party or something and you're around people who don't know about cyber, and say, oh, I don't understand all this cyber. Basically, there's really three different motions in the cybersecurity industry. You're either finding bad things, you're finding good things, or you're basically realize that those things don't work and you're kind of reinventing the future with resilient and repeatable and uh, defendable kind of systems. So we're going to talk about those things. Now, the cybersecurity market, started a long time ago, right? We started off with antivirus. Everybody understands antivirus. The model really, really hasn't changed, right? We have threat signatures, we have rules, we have different things, we put them on agents, and hopefully somebody with patient zero is going to get infected and we can collect that information, put it on us, and be, be defended, right? We've been doing that for 20 years. We've been basically doing that over and over and over again with many, many different types of technology. We did the same thing with network intrusion detection, which became prevention. We did the same thing with threat intelligence now, where you're producing threat data and sharing it faster and faster. That whole market has just, just cycled. But what I think is really interesting is if you look over the last 10 years, we actually started seeing some real innovation. Sandboxes, the, basically the concept of opening up documents, having the king's food taster, you know, I'm gonna explode those documents and those executables before they get to the endpoint. That was fairly innovative, and that was driven by a lot of lot of technology. Easier memory, more powerful CPU, virtual technology, different things like that was doing that. So when a lot of people ask me, you know, where is this, where is this world going? Um, most of the people that were, were if they focused on the last couple years, it was threat intelligence. Now, threat intelligence is not the end all. It's sort of the latest stage that we're at. We've basically assumed that we don't know, we can't get all of the uh, uh, prevention on the endpoints or on the network and defend that right away. So we have to basically be smarter about threat intelligence. And threat intelligence comes in forms of IOCs. It comes in forms of knowing about your adversary, their tools and tactics. And it also comes about understanding that this threat intelligence is sometimes not perfect. If anybody worked in threat intelligence, if you were consuming data from the government over the last Christmas holiday, and you had to actually push raw intelligence that CERT pushed out, you had a lot of false positives with that. So there's a whole industry now of basically just measuring threat. How good is the threat? How can I put it out there? How can I instrument my network and, and, and doing that? And what you're seeing is this segmentation between sensing and sense making. Now this might be a little too philosophical for a nine o'clock keynote, but when I sold Dragon, I sold a network sensor and I sold a bunch of rules that my sensor found bad things. What was bad was determined by the vendor. If I had a rule, I, I could see it. Now, when Snort came out and, and, and Dragon, we actually had the ability to write your own rules. People could come up with what was bad based on what they were doing. 
So now a lot of people are saying, look, if I'm buying all this great threat intelligence, we have some, some, some great people in the threat intelligence industry, if I can buy all that, do I really need an endpoint that's doing antivirus for me? Do I really need a sensor? Why can't I just have simple NetFlow or simple operating system artifacts, pull that into one data lake and smash that with intelligence? A lot of people are going that way. And I actually believe that where we're going to be 10 years from now in the future is that you will actually have people who just sense everything on the network. They will, they will instrument. And when I say sense, logging, NetFlow, APIs, cloud, things like that, it's all going to come into one point. And then whatever that organization's definition of badness could be, it could be IP addresses from China. It could be you know, API calls made by a certain type of browser that's known to be a fake browser for the antivirus. Whatever that is, that's going to be the person, that's how they view badness down the road. Now, we are also see, seeing some reassurgent in certain kinds of things. Behavioral auditing. We've actually seen a lot of companies come out and just track users and try to see where they're going and where they're coming. And this is also a reaction to the fact that people get compromised, people get fished, people's credentials get stolen. Perhaps the password I use for Netflix, if I have my corporate email as my Netflix account, is the password I use for my corporate email. And, and those kind of things are happening. We're, we're, we're seeing that progressing. And that's another way that threat has actually been good. People who are out there searching for those compromised types of information and then bringing that back to the organization. Now, my concern about this trend, though, as much as this is cool, because you've probably heard speakers say, we need to be sharing information better than the hackers, right? We, we can share this. So what I'm seeing is this trend, though, that people who buy into all this threat information, if I don't have any threat actors on my network that I can't detect with all this intelligence, I must be secure. And, and I've seen people actually stop doing interesting security things because their division of security is just, do I have threat? Do I have that kind of information on, on the network? So threat, the, the motion of finding threat is one motion. And that usually sets people up for, well, what is really, you know, what, what does it mean to be secure? If I want to move away from just finding bad actors on my network and be more proactive about being secure, that really means risk management. And you've all seen this expression, you've all seen this formula, you know, risk equals the threat times the vulnerability. This is the kind of thing you could tell your son or your daughter before they go, you know, if you work hard, you're going to succeed, right? If you actually try to measure this, we, we would probably get in an argument. You know, how do you measure risk? You know, how do you measure vulnerabilities? And this was actually something, even being the, the, the founder of, of uh, Tenable Network Security, what does it mean to be vulnerable, right? If you discover a vulnerability and you're behind a firewall, well, are you exploitable? Is there a way to do that? You know, do you have a, a time to patch that kind of thing? Is it, is it vulnerable, but, but it's only a client-side exploit, and there's no, it's, 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 it's debatable. But I, I actually gave a talk very similar to this at, at the Kaspersky SAS conference, and I said, you know, if, you're, if you can move and, and move up and down with what is a risk and what is a vulnerability, you know, it's kind of hard to do an example. So I said, think about the Smurfs, right? If Gargamel dies, the threat goes away. You can have all the, you can leave all the doors unlocked, right? Gargamel's not going to break in. And they kind of freaked out and said, hey, I uh, just made like a Gargamel reference and stuff like that. But I was trying to illustrate that point of what does it mean to do risk management. In order to do risk management, you have to basically get religion. You have to have some sort of sense of what does it mean to be risk-free or how do I measure or move? If you can't measure risk, how can you, how can you fix it? How can you decrease it and, and, and do or not? So, so about 10, 15 years ago, you know, risk management was real, it was only really in the government. There was all these standards. If you, anybody here was DOD or worked in the government, tons and tons of standards. You had all this paperwork, all this authority to operate, all these different kind of things. And it really became very, very cumbersome. And it was very difficult to, to understand, hey, are we, can, can we do this in an automated fashion? Now, if you work with any vulnerability management vendor like, like Tenable or any GRC, you can put in a lot of data and actually get some trends and different things like that. But what's happened over the last couple years is we've moved away from vulnerability management to configuration auditing. Because with, when you start going into configuration auditing, you get to minimize your attack surface. There might not be a vulnerability, a CVE for a bad password. But things like bad passwords and encryption on the desktop and how you boot, you know, do you trust the DHCP server? Do you, do you allow DLL you know, printer drivers to come from the printer? You know, simple things like that are actually the kind of things that pen testers, pen testers do. So what happened is people started to put all of these, this knowledge into uh, information. You had the Center for Internet Security hardening guys. You had the NSA uh, uh, black documents that allow you to, to harden things. 
But it was very difficult to take that information, and people turned that information into machine intelligence to basically do auditing. And there were technologies out there like, like SCAP. If you're a Nessus user, we had the dot audit policy and things like that. How can you actually audit what was on your network? But then what happened is the industry moved away from doing these tactical audit things to these frameworks. The first real big framework was the SANS top 20. And these are the top 20 rules that said things like, hey, if you didn't have knowledge of everything on your computer or on your network, if you don't track all those assets, you have a hard time defending them. All the way up to, hey, you need to have a user management, user education awareness program. So these programs like SANS got really, really popular. We also had PCI. A lot of people say PCI is a compliance standard. It's not really a framework. PCI is a framework. Very, very similar ways you can do those kind of things. And then lastly, the government, the US government, came out with the NIST cybersecurity framework, which was basically a way to look at everything that was going on out there and say, am I doing a good job measuring my risk, measuring my, 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 my risk or not? And at Tenable, I really, really was trying to push the idea of doing this real time. Because we saw comment after comment where people would do the threat, looking for the threat actor or the malware or the, the zero-day the zero exploit in real time, but they would do the PCI audit the day before the end of the month. So people's knowledge of risk management was this uh, a periodic process. It was not a continuous process. And I would tell you that if you pulled most of the, the vendors in this space who do continuous risk management, it's, it's more in, 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 in concept. It's not something that customers use and deploy on a, given, on a given basis. And even though we hear stories like, you know, hey, you know, I can do lateral movement and persist on a network for 100 days, 200 days, you know, a lot of times those kind of things are found with auditing. They're found with different things like that. So, so what's happening now is that there's been another explosion in, in risk management. Organizations are saying, look, not only can I instrument against these frameworks, but that's not enough. Because it's, it's, it's hard to do, it's, it's hard to do in real time. So what other things can I look at? You know, there's companies like risk-based security where they basically produce a version of risk to different kind of religion, if you will, where they're looking at all the data of people who've been compromised, and then they're allowing you to compare yourself against those kind of compromises, and you can figure out, should we improve, should we not improve against my peers and things like that. It's a very good social way to kind of tell your board or your executives things you should do. Uh, there's other people who are basically looking at botnets, and they're looking at that threat data, and they're trying to, to, to do some sort of threat score based on what you're doing. That's also kind of an interesting way to do it. And there's other people like uh, CyberGRX, it's a company in Colorado. They're actually taking risk from a supply chain point of view. Any type of bank, any type of organization has third-party suppliers. You have IT contractors, you have vendors, you have suppliers for details and things like that. And you have to make sure that those people are Y2K compliant, that they have security policies, that they have different things like that. And CyberGRX is trying to make those things up. They're trying to basically not make them, they're trying to track those things in a way that you can understand what the risk is of those things. Because if you think about a modern network where you have cloud components and you have suppliers and third-party contractors, how can you possibly do a vulnerability scan or just look at some NetFlow and make a decision about that entity? Entities are much more complex than that. Now, if you are you know, sitting here going, look, I've been doing um, you know, pen testing, I'm doing incident response, I'm reverse engineering, you're like, hey, all this compliance stuff doesn't really matter. It actually matters a, a lot. It actually drives budgets, it drives policy, and, and it, being able to speak, it's really an interesting skill for you to have. One of the best ways I've talked about getting uh, people to understand the NIST cybersecurity framework is a presentation from a, a friend of mine at Bank of America, Sunil, you gave at RSA two years ago. If you look at the NIST cybersecurity framework, it's, it's on pages, it's like hundreds of pages. It's really difficult to kind of go through and, and, and understand. But he basically broke it down into five different areas. Your network is devices, apps, uh, the network components, data, and users, and then you have these motions, right? You have to identify threats, you have to protect, uh, you have to identify what's out there, protect what's out there, detect and respond and, and, and recover. And he says a lot of times, organizations who have such a difficult time getting out of the weeds, because they're in NetFlow, they're in the data lake, they're in the Splunk web interface, they're looking at different types of um, a, a threat data. How can you get that high level view? And he says it's real simple. You just do a five by five. You basically say, what are my motions for identifying, protecting, and detecting, and my devices, my applications, and network? And you can put whatever you want in the box. You know, if you're an IBM shop and IBM's doing a bunch of this stuff for you, or Cisco's doing a bunch, or you, you've outsourced it to, to um, SecureWorks, fine, do that. But a lot of times when people are very honest, about how to protect a network and how to do that, you see a lot of white space here. And usually the white space is way over on the right. 
where respond and recover is actually a very, very difficult motion. Most of our effort in, this, in the cyber arena is over here on the left-hand side, right? I'm gonna do a lot of identifying, patch auditing, vulnerability scanning, it's, you know, different types of agents out there so I can query what's out there. And I'm gonna try to protect with firewalls and access control and different things like that. But we all know that even if we were perfect with those deployments, we're not perfect in our defense, we are gonna have compromises and failures and different things like that. So this is a great way to, to, to do it. Um, I really hope that every vol management vendor, every GRC vendor, every compliance vendor, every situational stock awareness tries to do something like this. And if, and if you think about it, if you go into a, a, a SOC, uh, this, is, this is one of the, the things I like to talk about. You go into a SOC and a security operations center and, and you say, hey, are you guys detecting attacks? Yeah, look, we've got a lot of attacks here. Source fire, snort rules, we got net flow, we got threat, we got, we're, 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 we got it covered, we're doing good. Sinkhole DNS, we, we got it covered, great, great. Um, all right, well, I just put evil.pdf on a random file in the, in, the, in the network. How long is it gonna take you to find those kind of things? And they might go, well, wait a second, um, we, we deploy Tanium, or maybe we got you know, some sort of PS exec script or WIMI scripts or Python or whatever, um, but we don't have coverage in this one area. And the biggest thing I really see organizations failing at is that they don't look at the auditing of the defenses. So I'll give you a good example. Um, change control for a span port for, for network uh, sniffing. I've seen a lot of people have, like that's more of a, 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 a nice thing the network people are doing to the IT people, or to the security people, versus a guaranteed sort of service level delivery of we need to do monitoring. Um, I've seen organizations roll out, you know, Tanium, roll out Carbon Black, and then seen, you know, IT updates for the Windows domain, crush those kind of things and prevent them from doing what they, they need to do. If you're going to be in the business of sensing in real time, you should also be in the business of auditing that your sensing and defense instructors are, are deployed correctly. Um, as a vendor, I, I've seen a lot of places deploy part of what they bought. Hey, we bought a site license, but they only deployed it on the servers, you know, that, that kind of thing. So when you do some sort of organization chart like this, some sort of way to cover what's out there, you should be able to communicate a story. Do we have the ability to sense everything we're trying to sense? You know, if you think about Star Trek, you know, it's just as likely for Worf to say, hey, the shields are down or the sensors are offline as it is the Romulans are on deck five. He's just as much in charge of knowing about the defenses and sensors for that ship as he is looking for the adversary. And we need to unify those kind of things. And I, that's really something I hope people take away from that. All right, so without being too crass, I think everybody knows that if you bought every threat detection vendor, every type of patching system, every type of, of, of auditing system, every type of real-time monitoring system, you still have the ability to get popped, right? There's zero days don't go away. Insider threats don't go away. Um, you still have this, this cycle of patching machines and trying to keep them going. So there's a lot of innovation that, that's happening out there. Some of this innovation is gonna affect us. The biggest thing that's gonna affect us is the move to the cloud. And this is something I see a lot outside of the DC Beltway. Inside the DC Beltway, there's a lot of organizations still running Exchange. Why? Because I can't use a cloud provider. But think about Exchange. You have an email server. You probably have backup. You probably have that system in a different location because of failover. You probably have spam and antivirus on those things. And maybe it's even part of your domain. When I ask people to describe their Exchange deployments, for example, they talk about, for a modern enterprise, 20 or 30 computers. That's tough. That's a, that's a hard thing to manage, a hard thing to monitor. In comes the Microsoft salesperson and says, hey, look, I can sell you an Office 365 solution. That's the same exact thing except it's in the cloud, you never have to patch it, you never have to you know, do anything to spend more money on it, and, and we're gonna give you a bunch of APIs and certifications that basically make sure this thing's guaranteed. Many organizations are going, oh yeah, I need to do that. Most organizations don't need to be in the business of IT to be good at what they do. You, know, you wanna buy Pepsi from Pepsi, Tesla cars from Tesla, you, know, you, you do wanna make those Tesla cars you know, secure and whatnot, but you know, having a good solid email server for them is not, doesn't make a great, a great company. And when you outsource something like that, you get a lot of benefits. So this cloud migration thing is interesting because if you think about a network, and when I walk into to a lot of organizations, they show, you know, show me your network, it's routers and switches and, and, and stuff like that. But a lot of times when I talk to incident response and forensics people, I say, what have you done to do incident responses on Office 365 or in Salesforce or in NetSuite or in Marketo or in Jobvite or in Workday? Right? I'm actually working with organizations now where all of their major applications are in the cloud. They're not on the network. Right? So when you get a compromise, 
there aren't going to be local logs. You're going to have to do JSON API logs or have, have some way to harvest those kind of things. And it's definitely a way of, 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 of looking at things. Now, the other thing that's kind of happening with, um, uh, with, with this trend is that people are taking their most complex apps, because almost every company does develop some sort of software, their custom websites, their, their mobile apps, and things like that. And they are taking them, and they are realizing that they can't fix them. Right? If you've got Apache on a LAMP stack, right? you've got Apache, Linux, uh, MySQL, PHP, you know, that's, that's 10, 15 years ago. But if you have a modern web application written in Python, written in JavaScript, written in Java, and you're trying to defend that with web application firewalls, probably doing good source code auditing, it's a very, very complex problem. Well, enter the world of, of Sec DevOps, where people are taking those complex web applications and they're breaking them apart into containers. They're breaking them apart into different types of components at the API level, in some cases where the APIs aren't even on your network. I've actually got a couple customers where they've actually gone all the way in with Amazon and they have Lambda APIs, where there, there isn't even a container to audit at that point. So those type of reorchestrations are supposed to be easier to maintain, right? There's no OS to patch. There's no uh, Apache web server to update. They're supposed to be easier to audit, and part of the whole DevOps is to see those change controls. And it's also a lot harder to attack. I've actually seen pen testers go up against well-written DevOps you know, web apps. It's a lot more difficult. It's a lot easier to see if something's going on. And there's a whole lot of new companies out there that are basically doing security monitoring for that DevOps environment, doing threat, doing anomaly detection, looking for vulnerabilities, doing different things like that. It's the same motion that you're doing on your networks right now, but you're doing it on a spread of Docker containers that, that, that's out there. So we all, we're all human. We know that some of those people who are writing those Docker containers are going to be really good. They're going to be really tight. They're going to be really hard to attack. But we also know that there's probably going to be some Apache Linux running inside a Docker container, bringing all the things that we've been doing wrong for the last 20 years. So when you go into an organization and somebody says, oh, we've rewritten our you know, federal uh, uh, you know, medical database, we've written this application, it's all DevOps and secure, you need to understand that that's a language you need to speak. You need to understand what those processes were, how that, how that motion of doing auditing is there. Because there's a lot of organizations saying, look, I'd rather not be in the business of writing this and using somebody else's API, using somebody else's cloud storage to, to, to do that. So that whole motion of doing stuff in the cloud and doing things more secure, it doesn't necessarily mean it's in somebody else's cloud. There's a lot of organizations who are deploying their own clouds. Most notably, the DoD and the federal government. We got GovCloud and FedCloud, which is basically a copy of Amazon. They want to get to that next level of having a virtual data center. And that stuff has a lot more interesting ways of, of doing auditing than, than you might have had with just applications that are on, on premise. So these are some big changes that are coming down the road. Now, from a cloud adoption point of view, if you walked into a Fortune 200, Fortune 500, most of these people are still doing things the old way. You'll see bare iron. You'll see virtual you know, data centers, a lot of VMs and things like that. But it's going to happen. Um, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen soon, probably the next two, three years. I think a lot of organizations are starting to, to do it. You've seen Capital One, for example, which I, I know is down here. They're very open about being very much the platform for banking you know, on Amazon, doing these types of things. You're going to see things like Netflix, where they're, everything that they're doing is, 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 is very interesting. And you're going to see press releases, like recently, um, I think Facebook took um, uh, their, their chat application, the What's Up, and they actually took it off of the IBM network and they're going with somebody else. So you're going to see these different types of, of things that are out there. Those decisions, if you're involved in auditing that stuff, it's a whole new world and a whole different language. But it does reduce complexity. It does make it easier to audit. It does make it more uptime. The last thing that I'll talk about is that you know, when people are adopting the cloud here, a lot of people will point to the outages on Amazon. Oh, we had that outage. We had that hiccup on Amazon East. And a lot of people are offline for, for a little bit. Before somebody uses that as a reason to not go to the cloud, you should compare their uptimes with, with those kind of things. I think a lot of people who are doing things themselves don't reach those same levels of, 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 of five nines and whatnot. All right, so, so that's basically the three different motions with, with cyber, right? We're detecting bad, we're detecting good, and then we're planning for, the, planning for the future. So if you walk into a customer and they are, or a client, and they are stuck in detecting bad and they haven't got to, you know, doing auditing well and different things like that, you can help them move there. But if you walk into somebody and they've got threat under control and they've got everything else under control, you can really start to get them to think about adopting the cloud, moving some of these things that are costing them money into other processes and lower that to make it easier for them to, to, uh, to, to do that. 
Now, having said that, all of those different three areas have startups that come in. And if you go to the RSA conference, if you go to any type of conference, you're going to see a lot of security vendors. And there's a, there's a plethora of them. And there's a plethora of them for two reasons. One, technology moves on, right? We had mobile, we had cloud, now we have DevOps and containers, and we have IoT and all these different types of things. And two, the need to do confidentiality, integrity, and availability monitoring of those different technologies is still there. So you see different vendors pull, pull in to do all of those different areas. So if you're getting pitches from vendors, and as a potential investor, I get pitches like this all the time, I like to ask them five basic questions. And you can use this when you're getting a pitch from a vendor, because one, you shouldn't be sitting through hour-long demos. You should be asking very discreet questions. First question, what problem are you solving? I, I still get decks from people where they send me a problem, and the first three or four pages are all about the cyber market and threats and how malware is exploding and different things like that. But what tactical problem are you solving? You know, this is sort of called the why. And a lot of times with vendors, and I was very, very guilty of this, we actually focused on question two. How do you solve it? If you actually start talking to a vendor and the first thing they say is, you know, we do vulnerability scanning and, 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 and blah, blah, okay. Is that a what or, or, or a how? And we make the mistake as listeners and potential buyers or users of this technology by sometime assuming what vendors are doing left, left and right. And I'll give you a really good example. I actually had a, a, a vendor pitch me a malware solution. And this malware solution could, it, it could detect things. It could, it could find zero-day malware. It could find stuff with behaviors and stuff like that. And the whole time they were talking, they talked like they were an agent. I'm like, so where do you deploy this? And he goes, on the switch. And I was like, oh, so this is like malware for infections. We've seen switches and routers get attacked. And goes, oh, no, no, it's, it's a sniffer. It's, it's on the span port. Oh, so, so I, was, I completely jumped to the how of, of what these guys did without under, really listening to, to what they were doing and, and, and so on. So if you're thinking about starting a company, you really need or, or starting a solution, what problem are you solving? And then, and then how are you going to solve it? And then I want to see some proof. And you know, if you're sitting there as a potential buyer of this, of a potential uh, a deployer of this kind of stuff, why should you deploy it on your network? What have you done to succeed? You know, is, if somebody says they detect zero days, or they do anomaly detection, or they do different things like that, show me. You know, we had all these different things like WannaCry. What, what was your detection of, of WannaCry? Did you find it before signatures came out there? You know, did you have an insider that you were able to find and, and remove from the network? Try to have some sort of proof. And this is really difficult because a lot of times people, you know, when they're pitching their companies, they, well, I can't really talk about this customer. You should think about what is the proof. If, if I'm buying a product that applies paint to a wall, I should be able to have demos of paint going on the wall. This is actually a very difficult thing to do. We saw Tanium getting some problems here because Tanium was using a healthcare organization to do live data. They would basically roll into an organization, they'd do a demo of their product, and they would do the demo by showing a demo of somebody else's organization. That's, you know, that's proof, but that's, that's kind of a tough way to do it. What funds do you need? And what are you going to do with it? As an investor, if somebody says, I want to raise $50,000, I want to raise $5 million, I want to raise $3 million, what are you going to do with it? And if you're a buyer for this, and you have to go to your IT budget and say, look, we need to have, we need to buy all these copies of this product. It's going to cost us $100,000. What are we going to get out of that? You need to be able to do that. And then last thing, if you're actually thinking about starting a, um, a, a, a company, I always like to talk about vision. And I've gotten benefit to work with some really interesting people. Uh, my roommate in college was Marty Resch. So when he started Snort, you know, I, what was your vision? He, he, was, he was open source. I mean, that, that was the vision, right? We're going to divide and conquer, conquer and give free de detection out there and whatnot. Um, when I talked to, like, Nir Zook from, from uh, um, um, oh my gosh, uh, Palo Alto, um, you know, when they started, they, they were really on this, you know, application firewall, application visibility for users. You know, I, I thought that was a great vision, especially in a market that was dominated by, or saturated with firewalls already. So what is that vision? And if you're sitting there in your organization trying to give a pitch, maybe you're trying to get Tanium to come in, maybe you're trying to get some other vendor to come in that you like, what, what's going to change? You know, and that's how you should definitely pitch that kind of stuff. So I'll be around a little bit after this, after this talk, and uh, if you have questions about starting companies or different things like that, definitely feel free to, uh, to, to bring that up. What is it in the deck? Now, there's a lot of different schools of thought on this, but there's a lot of extraneous information. If I stood up here and I told you that the, the amount of malware samples was going to go through the roof in 2017, and there's 50% more than 2015, you guys know that. And I just made those numbers up, right? Um, telling people about the market, telling people what they already know is not really a big deal. Um, 
Telling people about a success story, believe it or not, you know, if you're a buyer, you want to get that reference, that's, you're doing your diligence at that point. That shouldn't be the thing you lead with. That often confuses people a lot because if you're early adopting of a technology, you might not be using it the way the next 100 people who buy the product are going to use it. The trends haven't really happened yet. There's a bunch of different things like that. Media coverage is also another one. If, if somebody says you should buy my product because I was on CNN or Fox News or I spoke at Black Hat or something like that, th those are nice things, you know, but that's a diligence thing. What, what did they say? Why, why are they there? Um, you know, the one that I, 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 got, um, I got some people to kind of be a little angry, if you did offensive cyber and you were responsible for some of the, you know, stuff going on in the news, that doesn't mean you can start a company and, 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 and do, but I've actually had that pitched to me once, once or twice, uh, both internationally and, and, and here. But just because you're good at offense doesn't mean you're good at product management and doing a defensive style product. Um, so that's not what's in, in the deck. And if, and, and if you're sitting there and you're getting a sales pitch, you can, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, look, you know, I appreciate this. Can you send me the deck? Let's get to these questions. You know, it's going to make your time uh, better and, and, and their time better. All right. So any Rick and Morty fans here? A couple, couple Rick and Morty? All right. So this is the audience participation uh, part of the, of, of the talk. I've got some pictures of Rick and Morty that have to do with the future of, of, of cyber, right? So this is, this is um, uh, Rick Show and Morty the future, right? So we're going to try to predict the future. 10 years from now. Um, you guys have seen everything. You guys know everything. Uh, I'm not, probably not going to tell you a lot that you don't know. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a picture of this up and say, what could this perhaps be illustrating about the future? So he's in an antique store. We're going to talk about legacy, legacy data. When a lot of people predict the future of cybersecurity, they all kind of tend to predict it in a pristine, we're all in the cloud, we're all doing things, we're all auditing. But what we don't know is how long legacy stuff is going to stick around. And when I say legacy stuff, I'm talking about Windows XP. Right? Look at WannaCry. It hit most of this stuff like Windows XP. It happened to hit Europe and Russia and stuff out of the US a lot more. But if you've audited a DOD network, if you audited a banking network, I'm sure if we walked around here at the, at the college a little bit, you're going to find a Cisco PIX firewall and not a Cisco ASA firewall, right? You're going to find a, a, an old version of, of, of Linux running stored, not a modern Ubuntu kind of, kind of version out there. So how do you find this legacy stuff and how do you actually predict it? I've actually got to speak with a lot of econom economists about this. This is a very, very difficult thing to understand because we tend to think about vulnerabilities. We tend to think about new technology and things like that. But getting rid of legacy data in your network is really a hard thing to do. Uh, an example I'll, I'll show is there's a public company that recently got out called MuleSoft. MuleSoft is an API connecting company. If you have old data, like an old Sybase database, you need to hook it up to something modern like Hadoop, they've got a connector for that. They've got ways to connect things like that to Salesforce and to, to NetSuite and different things like that. They're in business because the old business is still there. Microsoft. The reason Microsoft 10 is like giving away you know, stuff with like their malware is because they're trying to entice people who are still on Windows 8, Windows 7 to kind of do these upgrades. So there is a tremendous amount of legacy stuff out there. And let's not forget the ATMs, the air traffic control system, the SCADA networks. I mean, some of these things that are out there, the last time they were touched was Y2K. So no matter what policies we come up with in the future, we still have this long tail of these old things that we need to protect and fix and, 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 and an update. All right. Any guesses? AI, that's a good one. That's a good one. It's a device, right? So what is that? IoT, exactly, exactly. He gets the butter if you haven't seen that, that episode. All right. So another big debate is, is how bad will the next 5 billion IoT devices be, right? Nobody knows. Everybody kind of says, oh, there's going to be more IoT devices than grains of sand and, and, and stuff like that. Or it's the attack surface, you know, I mean, if, and, and they, they point to the Myra bot that, that hit the external routers and stuff like that. But the reality is we really don't know how bad the next things are going to be. There are examples of people, you know, doing reverse engineering and showing things about how they can exploit hearing aids and, and, and um, you know, the, heart, the heartbeat maker and, 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 and uh, Dick Cheney and stuff, and stuff like that. And, and people are really worried about like driving cars, right? Hey, can we hack those driving cars? That's a big thing. But the industry is responding. You know, all of these things happened in, when, when Black Hat and DEF CON started. 
People would go for years, and Microsoft never showed up until later. Now Microsoft's like a big sponsor of, of, of black hat and security, and they've gotten that religion. There's very, very few people who are making devices who don't know that there's a security problem. And a lot of people know that it's a problem. They, it's going to take them a while to fix. Um, but there's a couple things that are going on. One, there's a lot of devices that are self-updating. Right? If you've bought a device, a TV, a router, a D-Link device, things like that, it will do self-updating. It will do self-patching. Unfortunately, it'll do it right, when you're getting down to watch Game of Thrones or House of Cards. That's always annoying. But the point is, that stuff's being built in. But the second thing is, there are a, t there's a whole industry of people who do reverse engineering and security testing and for these IoT things. This never happened. So yes, there's going to be an explosion of devices, but nobody really knows how bad it's going to be. Now, most of the folks are assuming that the intelligence agencies and whatnot are, are targeting these things and doing that, and they're, they're probably true. Um, but the point is, is that nobody actually knows, you know, what that device Alexa or the, 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 the Echo or things like that that you're putting on your network, how bad are they? How many vulnerabilities are, are, are in there? We're not seeing a lot. So it's very difficult to kind of say with actual facts how bad that's going to be. Real simple one, right? The cloud. So this, this, this episode was, had a, uh, 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 an amorphous beam that was cloud. The question here is, is anything going to happen to stop the migration to the cloud? We haven't had a major, major outage in a cloud provider. We've had minor blips with Amazon. You know, Netflix has been offline for, for a little bit. Um, but we have not seen something like Salesforce be down. Like almost every organization I know who sells something uses Salesforce. Are they ever going to go offline? Or are they going to have a compromise where you, all that data kind of get, gets out, out the door? Um, you know, ADP. ADP is very much not a cloud company. And they produce the jobs report. Like when you see the, you hear about jobs went up and jobs went down, most of that comes from, from, from ADP, the people who do payroll and different things like that. It doesn't come from Salesforce, even though Salesforce probably has more information about the United States and European you know, gross national product because of the data they have. But they're not as trusted because they're on, on, on the cloud. So the question is, is there anything going to be happen that's going to cause this reverse, this migration of people going to cloud coming back? Could it be privacy laws? I had a lot of people suggest that the European Union, who has passed the new data privacy laws, where if you're an American company and you happen to have data from people in Germany, data from people in Ireland or something like that, that you have to treat that very, very specially. That's a cost. There's a lot of people trying to get into the cloud market. I can't afford that cost. So I'm going to go and put something in Germany or something in the European Union just for that. It's very anti-cloud, that, 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 that type of stuff. So that's a fairly interesting way to kind of think about this. What could, could move things back? Because if we move back to servers on networks and running our own networks, that completely, completely changes the dynamic for the next couple of years. When the NSA was seen to be observed as being part of Facebook, as being part of Amazon, as being part of Google, people in the European Union, people outside of the, the, those, those organizations, didn't want to do business with the United States. This happened to me at Tenable. Like Tenable, we didn't have any cloud components. And I was selling in Europe. And they were like, oh, we're just assuming that the federal government. So that was a reason for them not to use you know, our, our kind of stuff. So those things could ha definitely happen and push that back. So in this episode, uh, you know, Rick saves the world from the, the, the big faces in the sky. But he's showing the, the, uh, the federal government. I mentioned the federal government a couple times. If things keep getting better and devices get hardened, you're seeing this now with the encryption debate. What is it going to take for the governments of the world to do intelligence gathering and signals intelligence? Are they going to put back doors into products? This is a possibility. This is a big possibility. And if you've seen this age of leaking, where the leaks that are being uh, leaked are exploits, well, why wouldn't they be backdoors? Right? So in a future world where there's backdoor encryption, where there's backdoor, uh, backdoors in general to get into devices and, and, and whatnot, in this age of leaking, is that going to be the future types of vulnerabilities that we're going to have to deal about? And then what is the social response going to be to those kind of things? When you, know, when you mentioned, it, you know, is the NSA booed or, 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 or not booed, it really kind of depends, frankly, you know, where, where it's going. Um, I think this is going to happen. I think you're going to see this. It might happen with or without the knowledge of the vendors who are producing these kind of information. But your responsibility to do confidentiality, confidentiality integrity, and availability you know, in, in the future is still going to be impacted by, by these types of things. All right, and the last thing that I, I think is going to be really hard to predict is just how we talk about things. So this is Rick's catchphrase, wubba lubba dub dub. And, and I see this a lot because I will go 
into Wall Street, and I'll address a bunch of CIOs, and I will go to high school, and I'll do a cyber patriot meeting. And both of these organizations, their people talk about networks completely different. When I ask somebody in high school or college to try to draw me how the network is connected, I see Salesforce connected here, I see LinkedIn connected here, I see Gmail and G Suite connected here, here's my box data store, that's my network. You add about 10 years to that person, they, they still draw routers and switches and, and, and things like that, and how things are connected and, and, and whatnot. So as we talk about security 10 years from now, the question is, is who's going to be doing the talking? You know, if you actually have the opportunity to do uh, software-defined networking, and you just have these clouds of data, clouds of compute, clouds of, of, uh, of access and whatnot, the network diagram is going to look completely different than it does now. And a big part of those frameworks, like the SANS controls, is understanding what data is on your network. How do I do that if my network is Amazon? And I actually don't have a network. I actually have customers that I'm working with now where they literally, they, all of their people use BYOD devices, and all of their compute and storage is in the cloud, spread across Amazon and Box and Gmail. How do you audit something like that? You can't vulnerability scan it. You, there's no network to plug into to scan. There's no place to put in a network intrusion detection system. And if you even were going to go in with those kind of concepts, they look at you kind of crazy. If you, if you look at the, like an Amazon person or a Box person, say, hey, I want to get all your telemetry and whatnot, they're like, well, you can get that from the API. And if you're expecting a span port, that's, that's a tough thing to do. So, so that is really the three things I want to talk about, right? The motion of cyber, finding bad, finding good, auditing and building for the, for the future. We talked about how to pitch a company. Told you five different things, everything from what are problem are you trying to solve, how do you solve it, all the way to, to what's your vision of winning. We talked about the future a little bit, and some of you guys had to Google Rick and Morty, and it's cool. There's, there's trendier shows out there, but, but you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. It is safe for kids, but it's, uh, it's debatable, I guess, right? <laughs> so, so very good. Um, so with that, I think we've got some time to do some Q&A. So if you guys have questions, just feel free to shout them out. We can talk about anything you want. Yeah, very good. So, so, so two questions. So, um, you know, will the vendors from today make this transition from, you know, on-prem networking to, 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 to cloud? And, and I'll, I'll tackle that first. So I think, that, I think they will, right? So if you look at IBM, you know, they went out and they bought SoftLayer. They bought their way into, into that, and they're, they're doing a good job understanding, you know, data analytics with, with, with Watson, right? We can debate if Watson's really AI and stuff like that. Um, Cisco, they're doing good to them. They've done a really, really good job of buying not only security companies, but cloud management companies. And they've learned at things sort of like the VCE thing that they did, where they partnered with VMware and, and EMC, and they tried to get part of this. They understood that they could not you know, be, that, be that kind of ecosystem. I think what's going to be people like Rackspace, I, I'm more concerned about, right? I hope nobody from Rackspace is here. But the question is, is, you know, is if the market for putting servers and running servers goes away, are they going to make that trans transition? Because uh, when you look at people who are designing things with Lambda and designing things with, with in the cloud APIs, and they adopt something like Amazon, they get locked into that, they don't, you don't need to run Linux systems and things like that. And then the, the second question the gentleman had was the depletion of the 16-bit you know, IP address space. Uh, so IPv4 going to IPv6. That, that's one that we've had that every year, you know, for, for a year. I, I see what's used out there. I think IP version 4, we're doing good because we've done natting really well. Uh, we've done the ability to, to, you know, to, to, to you know, basically reuse that, that kind of stuff. Um, IPv6 is going to happen. Uh, it's happening more in Asia than it, than it happens here. But you know, at Tenable, we had uh, everything we did with the Nessus scanner and our security center product was dual factor, uh, dual use IPv4, IPv6. We had like 1% even today doing IPv6. It's just not adopted as much as, as it is. Um, other questions, other comments? In the back.
So that's a great question, right? So how can we, how can we trust the cloud? How can we trust when, when we can't get to the firmware, we can't get to, the, to, to different things? And a lot of times I, I say that that's a true point. You, you're right. You know, the NSA could be there. Maybe, maybe your, your number one adversary is, is running you know, that, that network. But then I'll also ask, how often do you, do you do background checks on your IT people? How good are you about managing the firmware of what you bought? Did you do you know, vendor chain of command control of the Dell computers you bought from Dell? Are you sure that those aren't tapped as well? And a lot of times I get the, well, no, we don't, we, you know, we, don't, we don't view that as an attack vector. Of course that's an attack vector, right? That's how the NSA does things. They, they, they Trojan Cisco routers. That, that, that was kind of outed and, and, and whatnot. So my feeling is if you're going to go do the audit, then that's a valid, that's definitely a valid uh, thing. But if you're not going to do the audit, a lot of people I know, they outsource IT. You know, so you're, the person who's actually doing your administration and doing your, your, your provisioning your users doesn't even work for your company. So in that kind of space, it makes a lot of sense to go to Office 365 or something like that. If you're Citibank, you've got bigger issues to worry about. That's a very valid concern. If you're Citibank, how, how do I know that that infrastructure I'm out there with is doing that? So there's a lot of work that's going on to try to make that trusted computing. There's a company up in Maryland called Envale. Uh, Envale is, is a homomorphic database. Um, be careful how you say that. Um, but it basically allows you, to, you know, their, their demo is like, look, you can have the most sensitive database you want on the Chinese, you know, it, cause, just because they're the bad guys, right? Chinese, Chinese version of Amazon, and they can't, they can't read the database. And the underlying infrastructure doesn't, you know, doesn't matter. So those kind of things are coming. Um, but it is, it is a valid point. It is a very valid point. Any other questions? So just to reiterate the question, you know, are the vendors going to force legacy people to do, a, to do an upgrade? I think in some cases, yes, absolutely. In Microsoft, you've seen, they, they were pretty um, open about how they were handling WannaCry. I think they ultimately did do a patch for, for, for other things, but they were not patching those computers. But what about the legacy stuff that's 100% offline? You know, the, the, the microcontrollers that are in an elevator doing, doing, doing internal building automation, stuff like that, where you need a field tech to come and do that, that, that upgrade. That's a cost, you know, if, if it's working, you know, why do I need to touch it, right? And there's actually a lot of stuff out there that's been deployed that the only way to do an upgrade is to go and, and, and touch it. And they might be in our building, they might be right here, it might be my, you know, maybe it's my controller, it could have some zero day in it, who, who knows, right? Those things are gonna be harder to, 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 to touch. But at the same time, there's a lot of things that are working and they're just fine, ATM networks, a kiosk at things where, they might be on somebody's network, and then somebody in the future puts them on the same network, and now it's a threat, even though day one, you know, it was an air-gapped you know, type, type of network. So it's hard to measure. It really is. Maybe one more question? How are we doing on time? Okay. So the question was AI and machine learning. I have not been pitched a company that I felt had artificial intelligence in the security product. There's a lot of AI and machine learning terms thrown around that really do reduction of event, anomaly detection, things like that. That's statistics, that's not really AI. Um, there's some technologies that do machine learning that basically do the same thing, and, and that's kind of interesting. I've got, I'm actually invested in a couple companies that do machine vision. I don't really consider the ability to recognize a face or an IP address you know, on a network as, as, as intelligence, but those things are there. Um, what I am not seeing is a true AI knowledge-based system where you give all this data. I don't know anybody who has an un, you know, data lake where you just point an AI at it and it says, you know what, your really biggest problem is the NIST cybersecurity framework, you know, internal access controls, or you really need, if you change your patch management window from 30 days to, to 60 days, you know, you're going to have a little bit more, less security, but you're, it's really not going to be that bad. You're going to save a lot of money. I am not seeing any AI in that space. A lot of people are talking about it, but it really, it really isn't happening. I, I personally view AI and machine learning as the, the, the 3D glasses of, like, the cyber industry right now. It, it kind of feels good when you watch it for a while, but the more you look at it, it's not, you know, it just doesn't, doesn't. It. And there's some brilliant AI people out there. They're just not, you know, they're not, they're not from this domain. 
So I don't think I don't think it's going to happen just yet. Cool, sir. Mm -hmm. So the, the question was, what's my perspective on vulnerabilities and privacy in 2020? So I think that, you know, we live in America. I think if you choose that you want to be private and off the grid and stuff like that, you, you can do that. If you want to, I think I put my cell phone down. Yeah, so if you, if you choose to use a cell phone, you choose to being monitored. Um, and a lot of people don't really, you, they, don't, they don't understand that. They don't understand how much monitoring is going on there. So this concept of privacy, when you, when you have that, with the population where they're, I'm really worried about privacy, but then they're Snapchatting, you know, where the protest is gonna be and, 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 and stuff like that. It's a tough thing. So I worry more about 10 years from now, not being able to have that conversation. And, and people just understanding and assuming that they're being monitored. There's more cameras everywhere. More, and I'm not a privacy person. I'm not, I'm not advocating, you know, for that we all, oh, we gotta have 100%, you know, I mean, I get that. But I just think as we go on 10 years from now, it's gonna be, every next generation is gonna be harder and harder to them to decide to not be monitored. And that's my, that's my concern. So very good, very cool. Well, I hope you guys have a great conference. I really appreciate your attention here in the morning. Keep up the great work. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.